Now we have three microphones, and if you have a question, you can remain standing. We'll get one from each microphone. So uh, that's all we have time for tonight, I'm sure, is three, because the questions are long and so are the answers. So who wants to, oh, there we go, perfect. Now we need a middle, good, come on. Bob, are you coming up to that one? How many of you read my e-news this week that I sent out? How many of you even know what e-news is, okay? That's who the story was about right there. Bob, good enough. I wrote about you. I quoted your email. So, good. We got three? Good. Jeremy, is it too hard to stand up? Or you think? Okay, not feeling very good. Well, then you can be first, okay? And then we'll just go across. And I'm going to write them down, and I'll let you guys sit down. But that is a compound complex long question. So, perfect. Now, just a second, I'll talk about it. And Bob, don't forget yours. Hannah, don't forget yours. Um, let, let me just say, we'll go to Acts 17 to talk about whether you can be saved and with natural creation. Psalm 19 talks about the extent of it, and Rev, or Romans 1 actually is what you were talking about. Um, creation is one of the components, so we'll go through all that. But I had to write it down because I have very short memory. Um, and so, Bob, can't wait. Is it as long as that one? Uh, the question isn't, but anyways. Uh, could you share your thoughts and your uh, scriptural understanding of uh, Lordship Salvation. And since Lordship Salvation is a reaction against um, easy believism, maybe your thoughts there as well, but are there, are there tendencies or within even Lordship Salvation that seem to be pushing the extreme? You know, you always see these, these pendulums uh, back and forth. Um, from easy believism to Lordship Salvation or somewhere, and it seems like the movement of Lordship Salvation has some extremes to it. Curious about what your thoughts and your scriptural support for that. Good question. You know, Bob, um, Bob's the director, president, whatever, of uh, RBM Ministries, working with children. It's very fascinating um, how much of the gospel a child has to hear. Um, and whether or not, uh, but we'll, that's a good question, thanks. What a blessing. Okay, Hannah, I think I'm going to take my jacket off. These are getting to be hard. <laughs> and now, don't you do a hard one, okay? Um, I have a few verses. Um, in Romans 9 where it says, um, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Um, and my question is, since that is true, and he also says in First Peter that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Timothy, he says that God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Um, then why is it that, as Jesus says, many are called but few are chosen if God wants to save not a question of his justice, because I understand he's just, but just a question. Where, was that Romans? Where were you? I, I, the first one you read. Romans 9. Romans 9. Oh, boy. Now this is a big one. Uh, Romans 9, she touched on election. Um, she touched on, um, he touched on a lot of stuff. Yeah, predestination. Um, wow. I'm glad that one was last. We'll probably not get to it. Uh, so, <laughs> oh, what a blessing. Okay. Well, let's, let's do Jeremy's first. Jeremy? Is that Jeremy? Really? Because the lights are in my eyes. Good. Uh, let's first start in the Old Testament, Psalm 19. As you're turning with me to Psalm 19, where Jeremy's question was really um, a question that many people have. It usually starts out... Uh, when, you know, especially when I'm talking uh, to college students or high school students, remember I was a youth pastor and so that's where I was used to being. They would, I mean many years ago when I was starting out, they would say, are the pygmies, you know, going to be saved? The aborigines, you know, the people that have never heard of Christ, will they be saved and why would God send them to hell? And is it just for God to send someone to hell that's never heard the gospel. Really, that's, that's one of the strands of what Jeremy was uh, talking about. So starting out with um, Psalm 19. Now, the reason, now I want you to connect the dots here because 
this, this question, this first question, Jeremy's question, is, is a big question many people wrestle with. Uh, many people struggle with the belief that the Bible is true, knowing Christ died, and then saying, what about all those people that have never heard? So my short answer, uh, the first part is, uh, no one, well, let's see, it. for Alan, for Alan's sake, uh, he told me it's not big enough writing. No one uh, or none go to hell because they haven't heard about Jesus. Okay? People do not go to hell because they haven't heard of Jesus, because they haven't heard the gospel, because they haven't been to church. People do not go to hell because they don't have a copy of the Bible. People do not go to hell because they've never been in an evangelistic service and heard Billy Graham preach or anybody else. People go to hell because they're sinners, period. The bottom line is, all sinners, all sinners, who, Jesus said this, one of the awfulest things Jesus ever said is he looked at a group of people he was preaching. They were rejecting him in the Gospels. That was common. He paused, he stopped giving the Gospel, and he looked at him and he said, you will die in your sins. You know what he was saying in 21st century English? Go to hell. That's what he was saying. They were rejecting him, and any sinner who rejects the only antidote for sin goes to hell. People do not go to hell because they never heard of Jesus. They go to hell because they're sinners. And all sinners face the wrath of God forever. So it's very sobering. So what has God done about that? Because... That's how it's been from the beginning. That's why he, remember, salvation was initiated by God in Genesis. As soon as Eve was tempted and deceived and came and, and disobeyed and sinned and came to Adam, who was not deceived, and presented her, her sin, her disobedience, Adam joined with her in that sin. Paul clearly says in 1 Timothy 2 that Adam was not deceived. He chose to sin. He went along with his wife. But from that moment on, sin passed to all humans. It was before it was in humans, it was in the devil because God created everything perfectly. So uh, Lucifer fell and became Satan, and sin entered the universe. But it did not spread out until Adam who was given the, given the authority over the whole race, the headship. And so when Adam sinned, death, Romans says, passed to all. So let's go to, to Psalm 19. And this is just one of the ways you can explain this. And I'll go to those three passages. Number one, the, it says in Psalm 19 that the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. Night unto night reveals knowledge. Now, when you take biblical Hebrew, usually this is the first place you start because this is one of the easiest ones to, to memorize because uh, it's rhyming. But when David wrote this, he says, uh, Hashemayim, that means the heavens, uh, Misaparim, uh, which means declare, Kavoth El, the glory of God. El is God, Kavoth means heaviness. So it says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. And day unto day, and that word utters is the word for a fountain, like we were talking about Hierapolis this morning, uh, a fountain, a springing up. So it's, it's, it's the firmament is bubbling up his handiwork, and the heavens are declaring his glory. And they're, they're uttering this, verse 2, 24-7. Day unto day and night unto night. Now look at verse 3. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Continuing the same thought, keep reading verse 4. Their line has gone throughout all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them, that's in the heavens, he set a tabernacle for the sun. And, and he goes through this whole picture about verse 6, about the circuit of the sun, and there's nothing hidden from it. Wow. You know what that says? It says that God's revealed himself, Jeremy, through creation. So there's your revelation. Remember you said three things. 
personal, Jesus on earth, written the Bible, creation. Right there in Psalm 19, the, the heavens are, are speaking 24-7 about the glory of God. So what impact do they have? Well, look at Acts chapter 17. Now, you have to string together uh, three passages to get the what about the people that have never heard answer. And here goes a group of people that Paul's ministering to that have never heard. They grew up in Athens. Athens was Greek. Athens was a place of, of sophistry and uh, highbrow, you know, know-it-all university town kind of place. That's what Athens was like. And Paul stood in the midst, in verse 22, of the Areopagus or Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive in all things you're very religious. Verse 23, I'm passing through and considering the objects of your worship. I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Now, a little background. Paul was a student of his culture. And Paul knows how to, in this 17th chapter, is how to confront a godless culture that don't have kind of where America's moving to. I mean, we have had generations of decline of Christianity in America. We are becoming pagan in America. Uh, we can't pray, we can't talk about God, can't have Bible studies, can't, can't do any of that stuff anymore. And so a whole generation of kids are growing up and they know more about Halloween than they know about Jesus Christ. And that's why, if you notice, Halloween gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year because humans gravitate toward paganism because we are lost. And, and we, are, we are, don't like the light. And so we, we are drawn to the darkness. So how do you reach a group like that? Well, Paul, he found commonality with them. He says, hey, while I was walking here to talk to you, verse 23 of Acts 17, I, I saw an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Now, for just a minute, how did they do that? Well, if you know anything about history of, of Greece, in 600 B.C., there was a plague that swept through that area. And it was a devastating plague. And a prophet came. And this is, this is actually in literature. Epimenides is his name, a writer. Paul's quoting him. He's quoting Eratus, too. And he said that this guy came and said, you've offended, this prophet says, you've offended a God you don't know. And the only way that, that you can that you can make him pull back the plague is turn loose a flock of sheep and wherever the sheep lay down sacrifice them to that unknown God on an altar build an altar right there kill him on the spot sacrifice him and put to the unknown God so they did that 600 years before and Paul comes along knows this story and so did all of those people in Athens and he says I want to introduce you to this this God that that 600 years ago some prophet told you is out there and you've never met him. And he says, this is who he is. Look at verse 24. And this is how you share the gospel with a pagan world. Number one, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Creation, a creator. That's the first place. Why? Because down deep, we'll see in a minute in the third passage, right here, in Romans 1, everyone is born with a God-given awareness through their conscience and through looking around them at creation, that there's a creator. They know that there's, they have a conscience. God gives conscience is an ally of God's that's, that's a part of our created constitution, who we are as humans. And we have this conscience, and this conscience is, is revealing when we sin. And it says, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't kill people. You shouldn't eat them either. You know, and, and you shouldn't steal other people's wives. And there's, they don't even have the Mosaic law. It's, it's a law inside of them that God put in them that, that you shouldn't do this stuff. And the other one, in fact, my friend John MacArthur always says, everybody is born. Um, John always said this when I was out of grace. He said, Everyone, every baby is born with two candles. Well, Bonnie and I were newlyweds. And uh, it, we were, after we were at Grace for a couple years, Johnny was born. I was right at Verdugo Hills waiting and watching for those two candles. Because he says every baby is born holding two candles in their hands. And Johnny wasn't. But uh, everyone is. But, but look what he says. So you start out, you, you're hitting this creator thing. 
God made the world, verse 25, and verse, I mean verse 24, verse 25, nor is he worshiped with men's hands, though he needs anything, since he's given to all life, breath, and all things. He has made from one blood every nation of men that dwell on all the face of the earth. Whoa, look up for a minute. Jeremy didn't even ask this. God is non-prejudiced and does not see racial distinctions. Did you know there aren't three races? There's one. Look what it says. He has made from one blood every nation of men. There's only one race, the human race. Now, there were three sons of Noah, and our current population makeup of this planet has three distinct related branches. But there's only one race. And, and so racial inequality or, or racism or whatever has no place in the Scriptures. Uh, God has no respect to persons, no distinction. There's one race, one blood, every nation, and God has determined, look at the end of verse 26, their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Now, now here comes the Gospel. Verse 27. Now remember, how do you, how, how do people that never saved get hurt? Paul gets into that right here. And see, it's not speculation saying, well, I think, well, I don't think it's fair. How did Paul, who wrote half the New Testament, and who really understands Hannah's question, we'd like to invite him in to explain that chapter uh, to us, how did Paul explain it? He says, so that they should seek the Lord in hopes that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Wow. Remember when Adam and Eve fell into sin? Who came for whom? It says God came seeking Adam. He said, where art thou, Adam? Who is the initiator of salvation? Who is, did you know Paul and Titus calls God, God, our Savior? Most of us think of Jesus as our Savior. God, by nature, is a saving God. He, he wants us not to go to hell. He knows we're all in sin. But he, look, look he's not far. Look, look what it says in verse 27. He is not far from each one of us. For in him we live, verse 28, and move and have our being. Also, some of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. Wow. Paul quotes, by the way, from two Greek unsaved poets right then. That first line of verse 27, uh, so that they should seek the Lord uh, in hopes that they might grope for him and find him. Then he says in verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. That's what a Greek poet named Epimenides said. And then at the end of the, the passage, he says, for we are also his offspring. That's what another Greek poet Eratus said. So Paul is using this foundational knowledge that, that pagans had, that they didn't know the true God, but they knew that there was someone out there. And he says, verse 29, therefore since we are the offspring of God, that's the creator from way back in verse 24 who made everything, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature like an idol, gold, silver, stone, something shaped by art or man's desires. Or devising. Verse 30. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained and has given assurance to this by all by raising him from the dead. And now he goes in to introducing Christ. So what he says is you start with the Creator, and then you talk about a Savior. He's not far. He's looking for you. And then you talk about a judge. Now, so that's the how to hit pagans. Now turn to Romans 1 and we'll finish this. Do you see why we only had three mics? Biblical questions are very complicated. The Bible is not a Paul Little what and why guide. You know, he was a great apologist, Paul E. Little, and he wrote the, the what and why guide. And, and what he does is he answers all the questions in little paragraphs. Those don't come in the Bible. You have, to, you have to connect a lot of passages. And this is what it says in, in Romans 1. This is the the candle uh, uh, idea. It, it says in Romans 1, verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. God's wrath 
is revealed because of sin. Not that God hates people. God loved the world so much that he sent his son. I was talking to someone today and talking about their marriage, and I said, you know, you should, you should love the person you're married to, and they said, I don't. I said, I'm not saying you should have warm fuzzies about them. I said, you should make a conscious choice to sacrifice for them. That's what love is. Love is not a warm, fuzzy feeling. That's liking. That's phileo. God made a choice that he was going to save sinners, that he was going to make a way for them. Because his wrath, verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men, no matter where they live, no matter how much or how little unrighteousness they've done. Because, look at this, verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Woo. In them. And God has shown it to them. Now, you're back here. This, this is the idea of creation is, is constantly, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, creation is saying, there's a creator here, there's a creator here, there's a creator here, there's a creator here. And inside of us, Look what it says. It, it talks about both. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Back to Jeremy's. See, the, the Christ the personal, the Bible we're reading is the written, but here is this creation revelation. That's biblical. That, that idea that there's revelation from God. Since verse 20, the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even as eternal in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Uh-oh. Now, what we're saying, if you combine, and, and I won't, you know, drone on and on about this, but if you combine these three passages we looked at, Acts 17 says he's not very far from you if you grope after him. Remember, the Bible says... Twice. It says in Luke 1, the last couple of verses, that all of us were sitting in darkness, in the shadow of death. We're blind and in the dark. Can you imagine being blind, no eyes that work, and in the dark? And we're sitting there next to a chasm, and we're going to fall off forever into the blackness of darkness forever, into hell. And that's how we're sitting, and a great light shone. And, and that, that is how the Bible describes the gospel. But what it's saying is while you're sitting there next to the chasm in the dark, God has, Romans 1 says, given, there's John MacArthur's two candles. In them, that's conscience, a God, some have called it a God-shaped vacuum inside, this awareness that what I'm doing. You know when they interviewed the Akas, remember the Akas that... Uh, what, what year was it? 1956. In January of 56, they, they killed the, the five missionaries, Nate Saint and Jim Fleming and all those people. Um, do, do you remember when they got saved and were interviewed? They said, you know, we knew that was wrong. I mean, they never saw a Bible. They never met a missionary. They were Stone Age cannibals. But they had this, this conscience that God put in them. And since the creation of the world, his invisible verse 20 attributes are clearly seen. So, to summarize all this, the Bible says that every human being, from the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were, were pushed out, ex, expelled from the garden, the cherubim guarded the way of the tree of life, and they raised their boys, every person from then on has been born with their two little candles. And what happens is, the conscience one, it, it's kind of like the, the light on the dashboard. It keeps coming on red and it says, oil, oil, or check engine, check engine, check engine. And what you're supposed to do is pull over, lift the hood, and see what's going on. But you know what some people do? I heard about one driver, didn't like that light, and so they got some scotch tape and a little piece of paper, and they taped over it. They said, I'm not going to let that thing bother me. 
And they're one of those people that you see along I-94 that smoke is billowing out from under their, you know, their car has seized up and, and the motor is running with no oil and it's ignited and they have a car fire. That's what most people do with their conscience. They, they drink it to, you know, mush or they sex it to such, you know, hardness of their heart that they're so insensitive, they're like a branded cow. You know, some people get like a cow. You ever seen a cow with a brand mark, you know, the triple bar, whatever? Take your hat pin sometime and poke that brand. That cow will not stop chewing its cud. It can't feel anything there. People desensitize their conscience, and they finally go, not going to listen to that, and they blow out that light. They still have creation, the invisible attributes of God. Either one of those, Jeremy, the, the creation, the written uh, the, the seeing Christ, any one of those bring us to groping after God, saying, I know I'm a sinner. In fact, I saw this firsthand for two weeks of my life. I remember I lived with Francis Schaeffer at Labrie in Switzerland. And I used to, in fact, I didn't even know who he was. I was sent there by some missionary friends of mine. And they sent me to the herb garden. There's a funny little man with a goatee wearing sh pants that were pulled up, you know, squatted, pulling weeds. And I talked to him and he said he was the smartest man I ever met. And that night at supper, he said at the head of the table, it was Francis Schaefer. Every night at supper, 20 seats at that table. Dinner went from about 5.30 to 11 at night. And they populated it with seekers. And people came from India, they came from Central Asia, they came from Africa, they came from the Northern European elevated, you know, Aryan nations and everything else. And they would sit at that table with their questions and Schaefer would say, you're doing this. You're groping after God. Let me tell you, like Paul did in Acts 17. You see, the, the natural revelation, creation, and, and any, any sermon we've heard or whatever, brings us to the point of doing this and feeling after God and groping after Him. Now, I'm not going to, because we're not there yet, I'm not going to talk about who gropes and who doesn't and whether only the elect grope and feel after God and all that stuff. Acts 17, Paul told people that knew no doctrine, if you will feel after God, you'll find him. Read Acts 17. The same guy that wrote Romans 9 wrote Acts 17. And he said, if through your conscience being seared that you're a sinner and you are grieved over that, I mean, you don't even know that it's called sin, you just know you shouldn't be doing that. And, and through your other candle, you're looking like this and you're going, you know what, I don't think that this, this universe could have just happened. Then you know what you can do? You feel after him. I'm, you know, this is anecdotal, but my own wife's testimony. She was sitting in upstate New York in a little apartment in a huge snowstorm, and she said, God, if you're real, if, if you're really there, show yourself to me. I'm going to read my little Gideon Bible my aunt gave me, and if you're really there, show me. It doesn't matter if you're a pygmy or an aborigine or you live in in the bathhouse circuit of homosexuality in San Francisco, if you come to the point where you say, I'm sick of this sin, there must be a God, are you out there? He says, if you feel after me, that you'll find me. How do they find him? Now this, this is the last one. Look at Romans chapter 10. Because Jeremy, this, this we have to go on. Even though all this is in the Bible, and the candles, and conscience, and creation, and all that, Paul still took these people in Acts 17 and declared to them the gospel. And, and this is what it says. Verse 9 of chapter 10 of Romans. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord. Now we've gone from Jesus to the Lord. And by the way, that, that little verse, 13, is a quote from Joel. So what he's saying is, there goes the answer. You don't have to say Jesus Christ to be saved in Joel chapter 2. All you have to do is call after the Lord because they're inextricably bound together. Jesus Christ is the Lord. 
And he is the Christ, the promised one of the Lord. But look at verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The bottom line is this. No one go and I could have said this. I should have just said this, Jeremy. No one goes to hell because they don't know about Jesus. They go to hell because they're sinners. If they're a sinner and they realize they're miserable in their sin and they realize there's somebody bigger than them and that they can't make themselves and someone made them and they go like this and feel after him, somehow God gets the word of God to them. Do people get saved without the gospel revelation word of God? In missionary letters, in appeal letters, and and saying that people have visions and all this stuff, we hear all this, but they're off the page. The Bible said no. People are only saved through either reading or hearing the Word of God. Now, someone could tell it to them. Someone could pass it to them. It can be passed from generation to generation. But the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And James makes it even clearer. He says that you have to have the engrafted word, word, Bible, scripture, to save your soul. So, what about the pygmies? Don't worry about the pygmies. God has a a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week billboard flashing in the universe He built in an operating system inside of every human being. It's called their conscience. If they will listen to their conscience and start seeking after whoever made this, God will connect them. He really will. It's unbelievable to hear. I mean, the Ethiopian eunuch was in a chariot, and Philip runs and intersects his path and shares the gospel and leads him to Christ. But, bottom line, Can a person be saved apart from the Word of God since Romans 10? No. Okay? That's why Paul said in Acts 17, God winked in time past. We're not sure exactly what he did. It looks like Naaman got saved by by believing in the God that healed his leprosy. He didn't know anything about killing animals. He just believed that there was a God out there, and it appears. Nebuchadnezzar. I believe we're going to see him in heaven. He actually wrote a chapter of the Bible. He was a pagan, Gentile, idolater. But he bowed before the God who was greater than him. And so God can do all the math of all that stuff. But since Acts 17 and Romans 1, nobody on the face of the earth, according to God, can be saved apart from the Scriptures. But what about, then Jeremy got into this, more revelation, less revelation. Well, did you know, as bad as it is in hell... There are levels. It's not because Dante wrote his Inferno. It's because Jesus said, those that have much light are going to have many stripes. Those that had very little light have a lesser separation from God. But all of them, 100%, from Cain and Abel on to the last person that's going to be incinerated in Revelation 20, And during the millennium, because they rejected the true and living God, every one of them are born with this operating system. Now you say, Jeremy didn't ask, and he should have, what about handicapped people and infants? Have you ever thought about that? That's the real ones you should ask about, because the rest God has covered. Well, if you ask me that, I'll answer that, but you didn't ask that. So (laughs) we'll we'll go on. So, Jeremy, I could go on and on, but, but up until... The revelation of the Word of God, it appears that people were saved in this groping feeling after God. Since Paul wrote that down, they're only saved by the Word of God. And that's why we pray and we share and we we go. Because there are a lot of people that the Lord is stirring that are looking at their candles and they're saying, "Uh, where are you, God? And he sends us to share the gospel. And, and it's marvelous when you see how he is orchestrating all this. And, and he brings them. I saw it at Francis Schaeffer's table. People from every part of the world that were, that were groping after God and they came to Labrie and it, over dinner, Francis Schaeffer uh, talked them through 
what I just shared with you. And many times around that table, uh, people would come to salvation. And, and, but it was through the Word of God. Okay? Now, Bob, good enough. I'm going to give you a short one, a 10-minute answer, okay? What about lordship salvation? What is lordship salvation? Well, you're in Romans chapter 10. Look at that. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that's verse 9. Uh, it, it's very interesting. Verse 13, for whoever calls in the name of the what? The Lord, okay? So, uh, what is lordship salvation? Well, first, it involves the Lord, you know? That's what the Lord part of the lordship is. Um, but actually, what, it, what lordship salvation about is about is this. Can a person, well, let me, let me just share it. I'm not even sure whether Bob asked this. Well, you did. You asked about easy believism. The modern-day controversy about lordship salvation started because Louis Sphere Schaefer, Schaefer, in his systematic theology, has a chapter that talks about the persistent carnal state. And what he says is that it is possible for a believer to persist in a carnal state, carnality. 1 Corinthians, uh, you, you are babes, you are carnal, you are, actually the word carne means flesh, like carnival, you've heard of, you know, the carnival, carne equals flesh. So they're acting fleshly, uh, not, you know, carnal, comes from that concept for flesh. But wh what, what sparked this? Well, John MacArthur, I mean, it's, it's older than this, but in, it really hit the fans in the late 70s. John MacArthur was preaching systematically through the book of Matthew. Bonnie and I sat there. Most people chart their time at Grace by what chapter you came in. I mean, he could spend 69 minutes on one word and come back the next week and go 40 minutes repeating what he just said on that word. And so it took us years to go through Matthew. But as he went through, he preached about how Jesus shared the gospel. And he entitled his, his teaching, The Gospel According to Jesus. And what he said is Jesus called people to a gospel where they had to repent. Uh, and, I mean, it's all the way through the scriptures, you know. Acts 3.19, how are you saved? Repent and be converted. Uh, I just read to you Romans where it says, call in the name of the Lord. Uh, you know, whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. So lordship is from all of this, and, and we could go on and on and on through all of Christ's gospel presentations and the apostles. But why there's a controversy is we get, we get over here to Acts, like Acts 16.31. Does anybody know what that says? Believe. Just believe. It doesn't say anything about this word, repent. And so it got to be a controversy because a man named, um, what's his name, Ryrie, Charles Caldwell Ryrie, wrote the most popular study Bible of the 70s, the Ryrie Study Bible, and Ryrie put in the notes of his Bible that repentance, he wrote, is an unbiblical addition, to quote him directly, to salvation. He said that, that repentance is a work. And you can't add works to salvation, so you're totally saved just by believing the content, the facts of the gospel. Now, where does he get that? Because it says in 1 Corinthians 15, if you know this passage, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, Paul said, For I declare unto you, first of all, that which I also receive, how that Christ, and here comes the expression of the gospel, died for his sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And all of a sudden, the gospel is defined as, you know, a verifiable content. And so what Ryrie said is that since it doesn't say anything in Romans 15, Paul says, I declare unto you the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried, rose again the third day according to Scripture. There's no repent in there. And so repentance is, to quote Ryrie, a work. It's an unbiblical addition to salvation. So you know what that spawned? It spawned what Bob is asking about, easy believism. 
It got to the point at the height of this thing that John MacArthur, you can read this, it's in the Gospel According to Jesus, was, he was the most famous and beloved lecturer at Dallas Theological Seminary. He, was, he taught the Bible and they just, they couldn't get enough of it at Dallas. And as he was being driven to the airport by Charles, uh, I mean by uh, Walvard, he was driving along to the airport and John says, look at that. He says, what a place that, that damns so many souls. And Walvard said, what are you talking about? He says, that. He said, it's the liquor barn. He said, just think of all the people that are going to hell because they're drunkards. And Walvard says, yeah, probably. But he says, I know the guy that owns those. John says, well, you're sharing the gospel with him? He said, well, he's an elder at our church. And John says, an elder at your church? He said, well, he used to be. He's not anymore. He said, he just left his wife and he took off with an 18-year-old. So we're not letting him teach anymore. And, I mean, you can read this in the book. And John says, he's not even a Christian. Walvard says, he believes that Jesus died and rose. You know what John said? So does Satan. James chapter 1. Do you know who believes in the deity of Christ more than we do sitting here? Satan and the demons. They shake. When's the last time you shook because you knew Jesus was God? When they got near him, they shook. They trembled. They know who he is. They know all of his miracles are real. They know the Bible is inspired. They know he rose from the dead. They were watching. They know he created the world. They were singing, Job says. They watched him create the universe. They sang at creation. Just believing the factual content of the gospel leads us to, and this is where I'll close, Bob. Thanks for asking a controversial question. Look at Rome, or Matthew chapter 7, because this is what I'm calling, or why I alluded to John's preaching through, because it isn't John MacArthur that has the problem, it's Jesus that has the problem. Jesus said in chapter 7, verse 21 of Matthew, not everyone who says to me, Lord, remember we started with the lordship controversy. It isn't even enough to throw the word around, Jesus said. It isn't just saying, Lord, Lord. That doesn't mean you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father. Do you know what repentance is? Repentance is not an unbiblical addition of work. Repentance is a change of mind. The Greek word metanoia, N-O-I-A. It's, it's with my, my mind. I, I change my mind. But it leads to a change in my direction and behavior. Some people, repentance is like this. And, and, I mean, years are going by. I mean, and by the way, the whole time they're turning, they're, they're going the wrong way, and they're slowly getting... Other people, boom, they're like this. And they just, they just, boom. I mean, everything changes in their life. I mean, they, they hear the gospel and they're drinking, they never drink another drop. They hear the gospel and they're, they're into immorality, and they absolutely repent on the spot, and they go this way. There are different speeds of people repenting. Uh, that's why it says in Jude, if some have compassion, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh, pull them out of the fire. But look what Jesus says. The only people who will enter the kingdom of heaven are those who do the will of my Father. Now that goes back to Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own what? Way. All of us, over here where I had sinners circled, all of us are born self-centered, wanting our own way when I had go to hell because you're sinners. We all want our own way. Salvation arrests me in my own way. I hear about a God who says, you can't go that way. You have to go my way if you want to be saved. You can't, you can't persist. You have to yield to my will. And some people do a... Whoa. And some people do a... But if you never turn, look what Jesus says. It doesn't matter what the Lordship controversy says. Many will say unto me, verse 22, in that day... Lord, Lord, we've talked about your name, prophesied, we've spoken it. We've cast out demons in your name. 
We've done wonders in your name. And Jesus said, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, what this controversy spawned is, it got to the point in Dallas, not the seminary, the city, where there are actual people preaching. And they said, if you assent to the content of the gospel, you can become a Mormon, you can become a Jehovah's Witness, you can even convert to Islam. God has to save you. That was called an unbelieving believer. I mean, it got to that point in the city of Dallas. And they said, in fact, one pastor got up in front and he says, you know what, I have a church, they just don't get saved from the waist down. You know what he was saying? They live in unrepentant sexual sin. You know what the Bible says? Not everybody that says, I'm a Christian and I believe that content is going to heaven. It's those who do the will of my Father. Because only those, verse 23, know him. Salvation comes down to Jesus said. I mean, remember, the authority on salvation is Christ. And Jesus said, not only this Matthew passage, but he said, this is life eternal, John 17, 3, that they may know thee. And you know what Paul said? If anyone is in Christ, if you really know him, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you're a new creation. The old, remember we sang it, the old is gone. And the new has come. So, uh, what do you have to believe to be saved? You must believe the content. But if you truly believe the content, and you do truly know God, then you will follow him to some degree. And if you follow him, that is the evidence of salvation. Don't cling to, I made a decision. Cling to, has God moved in and transformed my life? Has he, what Paul, when, when Jesus shared the gospel, there, Jesus explained, he let, Jesus led Paul to the Lord. How do you like that? When Jesus led the apostle Paul to salvation, Acts 26, 18, you know what Jesus said? When you get saved, you believe the content of the gospel, that Christ died for sins, according to scriptures, he was buried, and he rose again. That's X, or 1 Corinthians 15. But when you believe that, look what happens. Acts 26, 18 says, seven things happen inside of you. Your eyes are opened. I talked about that this morning. You're turned from darkness to light. This is the turn. This is called conversion. This is called Repentance. I, I, I believe, I change my mind about what I formerly had as my basis. Repentance is in the mind. Conversion is the change of direction. So your eyes are opened, you're turned from darkness to light, you're set free from the power of Satan. If you've never been saved from sin, you've never been saved from hell. See, that, the essence. But you know what I'm saying right here? You never hear in what's called an easy believism church. An easy believism church says, try Jesus, just believe this, just, just pray this prayer, see if it works, you know? There's no calling them to repentance, no calling them to do the will of my Father. Because look at the end of verse 23, and then I'm done. Depart from me, you, and here's the word. This is the essence of the Lordship controversy. You who practice lawlessness. When John and Walver drove by the liquor barn, you know what John said? He said he's not a believer unless he repents of that. Why? Because John said it. Jesus said in verse 23, if there's an unbroken practice of lawlessness, if the lawlessness has never been broken by the power of God to turn them from, from the power of Satan unto God to receive forgiveness of sins, and an inheritance among those that are sanctified, Acts 26, 18, then they've never been saved, no matter what the pastor says, no matter what the certificate says, no matter how many times they come forward, no matter how many times they pray the sinner's prayer and raise their hand. If there's not a supernatural... See, to be born again is not something I do, it's something God does. And what God does is He gives me a new heart and a new spirit. 
and he turns me from darkness to light. What I'm saying right there, the gospel from the Bible is not what easy believism teaches. What they say is just the facts. God has to save you. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. I read you what it says in the Bible. And so when I was interviewed at Dallas, can you imagine this? John had the audacity in the gospel according to Jesus to put my name in the front and dedicate the book. And I went, Pfft. So now I go to Dallas to get my degree. And all the Bible faculty say, defend that book. And I said, I'm not going to defend John's book. But I will talk about this one. And I said, let's talk about the calls to repentance in this book. And they said, okay, we'll pass you on that one. And we went on. You see, the Bible teaches a very heavy duty, repentance, that is easy, just believe. But it issues into a supernatural event. Okay? And it's 721. We're going to have cut the cake. Come on, let's all stand. I'd like to invite St. Philip up here, my wonderful friend. Chairman.